Morning, everybody. Um, first, to let you know that I've prepared quite an extensive background paper, which will be on the Chamber's website. Uh, I'm not going to have time to cover everything in that paper. I've done it as a resource that you can ask, access at your leisure, uh, so that you've got some better idea of the issues I've, I've been asked to cover. My brief is to consider what New Zealand, and especially the Bay of Plenty, can learn from what has been happening internationally with local government. Uh, and I've been asked to draw on the experience I have working quite extensively in Australia and further afield with colleagues from uh, both Europe and North America. Uh, so that what I'm bringing today is a perspective of what's happening with local government worldwide and more to the point, why is it happening? And to set it in the context of the government's current uh, reform program and some of the things it's done in the, in the First Amendment, including enhanced mayoral powers and the change to provisions for local government reorganisation. Doing so is a real challenge. Uh, I, I sometimes personally wonder whether we've got to a point where it's almost impossible to have an intelligent public debate about local government in New Zealand because we've got so distanced from the mainstream of developments around the world. Uh, there are reasons for that, um, which I'll go into, but you know, we face a situation where government policy in respect of local government is going in almost exactly the opposite direction from equivalent jurisdictions elsewhere. The idea of you know, restricting local government to a narrow range of functions, um, you know, pinning it down, uh, it just doesn't sit alongside what most other jurisdictions are doing, which is saying that local government is an essential partner across the range of things that central government has an interest in, and it's important to develop a collaborative partnership approach, not just around infrastructure, but around social services, economic development, uh, the whole kit and caboodle of the future of communities. Why, I wonder, is that the case? I mean, we've, we've seen a situation where the media reaction to this conference was automatically, this is going to be about amalgamation. Rethinking has to be, of course, rethinking boundaries and structures. In the rest of the world, that's almost a secondary issue. Rethinking local government is thinking about what kind of governance does a country's communities require to meet the issues they're addressing over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Structure is a subsidiary issue in the, the old saying that form follows function. But I think the media response reflects where our debate is compared with where what I would sometimes call the serious thinking about local government has really got to. I think the reasons include geographic isolation. We can't just you know, hop on Eurostar and go and see what they're doing across the channel. Um, our channel's 2,200 kilometres wide. Um, we don't really know what our neighbours are doing or why, and it's not very easy to bring that knowledge back. Uh, we have a lack of depth in public institutions and public debate. New Zealand has a single unicameral parliament, so there's not much debate within the public arena. Australia has three unicameral and five bicameral, which gives them effectively 13 houses of parliament that are able to debate public issues, and that inevitably means that there are different views out in the public. We don't have a think tank culture and a practice of investing in research. Um, we don't, because of our scale, have the ability to put the kind of investment into investigative and political journalism that's a feature of most other jurisdictions, even in the tough environment that the media now faces. Um, and we do have a highly centralised political culture. The Economist has twice, I think, described New Zealand as just about the most centralised uh, governing structure outside North Korea. Um, and we do have a view that if something needs to be done, the government should do it. And I remind all of you of Tom Scott's cartoon a few years ago of an acne-ridden 23-year-old sitting in Treasury uh, ruling the country. Um, so we have a number of institutional barriers and cultural barriers to really good debate about where we want to go and how we want to get there. A bit more context. If you look at government policy statements, you come to a view, I think, and this is trying to read between the lines, that the government really sees local government as a subsidiary tier of government, properly subject to detailed direction and oversight by central government. One of the things Mike didn't refer to is the powers that government has graciously given 
the Minister of Local Government to, quotes, assist local government in difficulty. And when you read those, um, you can get quite horrified that it's primarily concerned with service delivery and local regulation. And it's perhaps best thought of as a set of locally owned uh, infrastructure companies which are nationally supervised and do have a few peripheral functions as well. So it's, it's not a view which coheres with the way people think about local government elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't address how do we get to grips with some of the major issues that trouble all of our communities. You know, dysfunctional families, affordable housing, well that's starting to come onto the agenda. Issues around economic development, how do you cope with an ageing population. A whole raft of things which are critical for the health of communities, but essentially the government here at the moment appears to be saying, well we're not sure whether the local government really has a role in that, but is unable to answer the question of who really does. Contrast what's happening in New South Wales, where there's a, a review underway at the moment. Uh, an independent panel set up jointly by the government and by the peak organisation, the LGNZ's equivalent. This is what they say in terms of local government's got to change. But look at what I've highlighted, what they're saying about the potential of local government, of councils. They can be the catalysts for improvement across the whole public sector. They can demonstrate how to tackle complex problems by harnessing the skills and resources of communities. That's not on our agenda at the moment. In my view, it absolutely needs to be. In, inc incidentally, the New South Wales panel is also talking not about the reform of local government in the sense of the formal structures and institutions we've got. It's talking about reform of the local government system, bringing the system together to work more effectively. And that system includes not just councils, but peak organisations, major stakeholders, government agencies that have an interaction with local government either as a regulator or as a potential partner or as a deliverer of services within the council's area. Their panel are saying, got to bring all of that together. We're looking at a world which operates collaboratively to get the outcomes communities want, not through the silos that New Zealand still seems to think matter in terms of how we deliver. So what am I going to cover as quickly as I can? Four themes, globalisation, including the rise of metropolitan centres, the role of local government in respect to major social services, developments in community governance, and recent and prospective legislative change. First, to globalisation. A couple of themes. We've seen the ability of governments to manage what happens within their local economies diminish greatly as a consequence of globalisation, and broadly in ways that individual governments can do very little about. And the current debate over the exchange rate is a very good illustration of that. I'm sure if the government th thought it could do anything, it would absolutely do it. It knows it can't. So we're in an open, exposed environment as a consequence of what's happened with globalisation. What does it mean for local government? Uh, local governments aren't exporters. They, by and large, don't have strong international relationships, despite the sister city situation. It's absolutely pivotal. Why? Because if we are to survive, our tradable sector, the people who export, and look what's happening with manufacturing productivity or production at the moment, it's in severe decline, as we know. Because of relative competitive strength, what that means is that there's an absolute obligation on anyone who's in what's termed the non-tradable sector to make sure that whatever they do and however they do it has the least possible cost impact on those poor people who earn a living by exporting or by competing with imports. Now, much of what local government does has exactly that impact. Some of it's fees and charges. Some of it is how decisions are taken. You take three months to take a decision that could take one month, the person on the other end faces an increased cost and probably a significant additional cost of capital in terms of hanging around waiting for you to decide. Uh, Judy gave some fairly good signals earlier. In Australia, there have been some major reports around the need to improve. It's very clear that we are in an environment now where one of the things that business wants from local government is do what you do in whatever way will give the outcome we're looking for at the least possible cost. 
And if that means turning your regulatory people upside down and making them understand that they are really working to help support people, not to inhibit their activity, uh, if it means completely changing the way you deliver services in order to get the benefits of scale or strategic capability, then do it. Because we cannot afford, as a country, a significant sector such as local government imposing unnecessary costs. Got nothing to do with ideology. It's the practical reality that if we want a living, we're competing with others who themselves are getting their cost structures down as far as they can. So, okay, that's an absolutely critical issue, and it's one that local government needs to take on board. And we'll need to do collaboratively with other stakeholders as well, because often I think local government doesn't actually understand how what it does impacts on outside parties. I think the real issues in terms of culture and knowledge, especially amongst regulatory staff, who may not have any idea about the relationship between the way they act and what it means in terms of employment levels in the community and profitability of the people who would argue they create the real jobs. Second thing, growing importance of cities. Um, this is a quote from a recent and significant research paper. Um, countries are losing power, and one of the countries that's really been losing most, power to direct what happens, is, is New Zealand because of scale. Worldwide, at the moment now, 50% of the population live in cities. We passed that mark in about 2007. By 2050, the UN expects 70% to be living in cities. More to the point, what's clear is that larger cities are becoming increasingly significant, what economists call agglomeration economies, attracting people to locate in larger centres. Despite the internet, despite the ability to work remotely, it's very clear that Face-to-face -face contact is critically important, and especially for multinationals, the ability to get together, uh, the high cost of travel, it's not the airfare, it's the time of the people who are travelling, means that large centres are becoming increasingly important. New Zealand has one possible candidate in the metropolitan centre stakes, Auckland. No other centre has the scale or the characteristics that will give a any possibility of becoming part of that strong international network. Um, <clears throat> just a further point on that, basically it means for places like the Bay of Plenty, learn how to leverage off what's happening with Auckland rather than thinking our economic development strategy is competing against Auckland for business location. We've got to work out our complementarities, we've got to learn to ride the wave that Hopefully, Auckland will create. That's nothing to do with whether you like Jaffers or hate Jaffers. It's to do with the way the world is working, and you ignore that reality at your peril. Special case of rural and regional areas. One of the things we know, and Natalie Jackson will be giving you a much more informed presentation than I can on this, demographic change and population shift is impacting very differentially across New Zealand's communities. On that, you'll see that Tauranga and Western Bay of Plenty can still look forward to reasonably high rates of growth. Most of the rest of the region, I've included South Waikato, it sits in the Mineral Forum amongst others, are facing population decline. And the evidence, you won't like it, it's very, very hard to turn that around. Appointing an additional economic development officer isn't going to cut it. And, and in many respects, a lot of communities are going to have to learn how to cope with declining populations uh, and manage that kind of change. The farming community has got a particular challenge in this because a lot of this is driven by improvements in agricultural productivity, which ironically demand higher skilled people at the very time when the services that those people will want to have locally are declining and farmers don't want to pay the rates that support those services. So there's a dialogue that has to take place between farming and local government, especially in, in the smaller council areas, about how do we maintain the quality of life and the service base that's going to be critical if we, the farmers, are to recruit the people who manage our farms. Don't think that debate started yet, except in Taranaki, where they actually do think ahead a bit. Major social services. Local governments always stayed away from these, 
the argument being that rates is not a good tax base for social services, perfectly correct, that government's got the good taxes, so government has the obligation. But what we now know, and this is internationally rather than, than in New Zealand, what we call the wicked issues, dysfunctional families, all those sorts of problems, uh, you know, educational underachievement, they're persistent, they stay with us. And we know more and more now that dealing with those effectively requires strong community-based activity, it requires collaboration, it requires bringing together the knowledge and networks that local government is far better place to tap than central governments ever will be. And there's very hard evidence from research, particularly in the UK, but also with Canada, coming through in Australia, that this is an absolute reality and an important role for local government now is actually that coordination, collaboration, community leadership role. And if anyone tells you, your council assists you, the proper role of local government is to do the roads, rates and rubbish, they've told you they're not fit to be a councillor in terms of the needs that councils now face. I make, you know, that sounds a harsh statement because we haven't had the exposure to the kind of knowledge we need to understand that. Hopefully we're getting there, but it's a, another critical issue for the future of our communities. We're not going to manage an ageing population, uh, for example, in terms of issues around ageing in place and so on, without very strong community-wide networks, and they need leadership. Okay. Um, but government's view may be starting to change in this respect. A report last, oh, actually 2011, December, Better Public Services, looking at how to coordinate delivery amongst government agencies, actually talked about delivery in smaller communities and referred to the significance of the governance boards being established, chaired by the local mayor, uh, but talked to the Better Public Service people and they'll tell you, well, we don't know enough about local government to be able to know how this could develop. Disconnect. Um, fascinatingly, Bill English, in a recent uh, interview in which he was basically saying to the Auckland Council, you fix the land supply problem or we will, um, also said, and this is critical, government doesn't have the knowledge of the local circumstances in the way councils have. That applies not just to, it applies to everything that happens. It applies in Auckland to how do you deal with the kids who are dropping out of education, where the government initially said Auckland Spatial Plan shouldn't be talking about that. But look at the research evidence and we'll tell you that the quality of communities and how communities work is a critical factor in educational success. And that's much more down to local government and the communities local government leads than it is the government. So real possibilities also, the, the evidence suggests that when governments start to recognise the potential of local government in that way and the ability that that has around better targeting and design, uh, Bill referred earlier to things like co-design and co-production which are emerging in other uh, jurisdictions, you actually get the cost of doing those services down. Some of the UK evidence talks of savings in the order of 20% which is very significant for governments that are strapped fiscally. So message for government, hey guys, you need local government to actually manage your fiscal risk. And if you don't actually engage effectively, you've got some real problems ahead for the taxpayers. Developments in community governance. One of the things that's becoming very evident around the world is that the average person in the average council area is focused not so much on what happens, for example, across the whole of Tauranga, it's what happens on my patch. We've seen a shift internationally and in New Zealand away from voting. Why? Because if you think about voting, it doesn't actually allow you to influence the things that matter to you. How many people here, for example, know that when they go and vote for Joe Bloggs, that means that the council will start working in a different way around the local park, what happens with traffic management, noise control, trees, whatever it might be that particularly concern you. So much more a focus on, I want to be engaged and part of the decisions that affect where I live, what I do. That's typically at a sub-council level, so it's what are the mechanisms for getting better engagement in that space. Um, it's a shift from representative democracy to participatory. But then remember, representative democracy is an 18th century concept around 
national governments with very narrow functions. It's not a 21st century concept in terms of the complexities we face. Um, some of the recent work in Australia, and uh, we've been involved in leading this, um, has highlighted very different approaches. Councils are looking at how do we get people engaged. One council in Melbourne supporting a number of what it calls township groups. Doesn't much matter what they were started to do. What more matters is that they've got good community networks, they provide a space for dialogue, and for talking about the things that matter in an individual community. It's shifting the relationship between elected members who are becoming more facilitators of decision making rather than deciders and bringing in much greater strength. Um, this from the blog of a general manager in a middle class Sydney council reflecting on findings from a ratepayers uh, satisfaction survey which had really astounded the council. Residents appeared to be less concerned about the traditional activities and much more in what could loosely be termed participatory democracy. The survey findings say that out of 10 drivers, what they really want, the top two were access to council information and community involvement in decision making. That's not a message which I suspect that most New Zealand councils yet really want to hear. But it's the reality of what is now happening in communities around the world. It's happening in New Zealand, but it's less easy to express it. And it's fundamental in terms of being able to get the quality of community that people want and getting away from the we'll do a one size fits all to something that says what, we should, what we're doing should fit the situation of the place we're doing it in. Legislative change. I'm not particularly, apart from the confusion of the change purpose, I don't see that it actually changes very much. Public services, by definition, are things that the market won't provide, and councils do them, again, virtually by definition, to promote community well-being. So what's changed? Um, other than a certain amount of confusion. Numeral powers. Okay. The numeral powers, I believe, uh, represent the most significant, and it's a quite surprising, a step in recent years to improve local democracy and democratic accountability. Now, why do I say that? I've been looking around the world at what's been happening with the role of mayors and why. It's increasingly common to support elected executive mayors. The mayor of London was put in place, um, or that post, by a Labour government that believed that the voters were entitled to be able to vote for somebody who had the ability to put forward a manifesto and would then, could then be held accountable against that. The issue, and we have it in New Zealand, voting for the local councillor tells you nothing about what the council is going to do and it gives you no basis for holding that councillor accountable. Nobody can stand for a councillor in New Zealand currently and say, when I'm elected, I will ensure that X is done and be able to deliver on that. It's not the way our councils work. Um, the new mayoral powers allow a mayor to establish committees, appoint committee chairs, some other extended powers. That underpins the potential for a mayoral candidate to stand on a manifesto to say, this is, as mayor, how I will ensure the council functions, these are the kind of committees and the processes that will be in place, and maybe even, and this is the team that I'd like to have around me to help do that. It's incredibly significant. I know that a number of mayors are worried about, well, how would it affect my relationships around the council table? And the government put a little bit in to say, oh, by the way, the council can overturn that. But any mayor with those kinds of powers and any reasonable political skills and interpersonal skills will have a majority around the council table once those powers have been used. Uh, to me, the critical thing is that's going to really fire up local democracy and local accountability and the minor inconveniences around a council table of, well, we really didn't like the mayor doing this, um, I think pale into comparison with the importance of making local government more accountable. The new reorganisation provisions, Mike's described those a bit. One view I've come to, and I think Mike shares it, is this business around demonstrable community support effectively means that a hostile takeover, say by the Western Bay of Rotorua, uh, 
is completely impossible under that legislation unless people of Rotorua wanted a hostile takeover. Um, so I think the consensus that's starting to emerge is that the government may have made it harder to achieve local government amalgamation. I'm not too bothered about that because for me amalgamation is seldom the right answer to the kind of questions that we're trying to deal with. And again, the international evidence supports that. So okay, let's move on quickly to what I see as the implications for local government in the Bay of Plenty from international experience. What does it tell us? First, local government is becoming more, not less important. Keep that in mind. That's absolutely critical to understand that the governing role, the community leadership role of local government is an essential as we move forward. It's less about spending ratepayers' money, much more about using local government's capabilities. It's the one body any community owns that's there, has continuity, and has a real depth of skill in dealing with the kind of issues the community needs to handle. And local government's leadership potential. But local government can't do it on its own. We've got to get past the kind of their master relationship which too often is the case between local government and community. And often reflected, for example, in the way the media talks about local government. It almost looks like the enemy most of the time. It's not. But this does require a strong collaborative approach. It requires the third sector. It requires business also to accept the responsibility for community leadership. And we've not been good at doing that in New Zealand as compared with how other countries handle these sorts of things, where business, for example, sees itself as a leader in this area and a collaborator with local government. We need to confront and work through the wide and growing gap between the government approach to local government in New Zealand and government approaches in other jurisdictions. We've got to make, understand and make the case for a more intelligent and more effective approach. Um, I don't entirely blame the present government. Again, it goes back to the simple lack of knowledge because of our isolation and our lack of research in, the, in these areas. The impact of globalisation has major implications. It's imperative that councils do everything they can um, to you know, just reduce the cost. One of them is lifting the game in shared services. Boplas in the Bay of Plenty is a model and a good one, but it really needs to be revved up. We've got to ensure that anything that can sensibly be shared is shared, uh, and the community needs to demand that from its councils. Cities will be increasingly dominant. The Bay needs to understand what that means um, and look at, in particular, major gaps in local infrastructure. And the standout gap, when you again look at in, in the international research around these sorts of areas, is the lack of any serious endeavour, and I'm going to sound slightly harsh in this, to create within the Bay a research-based tertiary presence that can complement the, the basic resources that exist in the Bay. I know there are discussions going on about a tertiary presence here, but to be candid, that looks more like you know, protecting the business of a particular institution rather than meeting the needs of the Bay of Plenty for a strong research-based tertiary activity. And just go and have a look internationally and see how these issues are addressed and you'll understand what I'm saying. Um, so, moving on quickly. We need to recognise the very different scenarios facing the Bay's different councils. It requires community-specific strategies. It's very much saying one size doesn't fit all, and we've got to clearly understand that, and how you know, the strong can help the less strong as well. An important role is the, going to be, for local government, to, to be a catalyst in the more effective delivery of major public services, and I've talked a bit about that. Uh, and it's again using its leadership, its networks, and its capability. Um, the old representative model has to a degree run its course. We are now in a situation where we need much more of a collaborative, participative approach to deal with the issues that confront all our communities. The new mayoral powers are an opportunity to enhance local democracy. It'd be fascinating to see how they play out in practice. I think it'll take a while for them to settle in and people to understand the potential, but it's local democracy on the rise. Um, the new representation provisions, as I've said, will probably make hostile takeovers virtually impossible. 
there's a need to think carefully about amalgamation as being the silver bullet. There's been an awful lot of research internationally about what amalgamation actually does. Nobody has yet been able definitively to find a single instance of amalgamation which has seriously reduced costs without doing it through reducing service. Um, it's pretty, pretty tough territory. The better issue is to say, what's the problem that we're trying to solve, and what's the best way of solving the problem? Some of that will be through major, focusing on the major regional issues we need to sort. Infrastructure is an obvious one, uh, where scale and strategic capability are significant and where it's very difficult for local authorities the size of ours to be able to do that effectively. Um, another area where we have an issue in terms of deficit is the community governance one, which I've spoken about. There's a clear need to focus much more strongly. It's an area, unfortunately, which for local government in New Zealand is a bit distorted by the community board experience and the very unfortunate decision of the remuneration authority a few years ago to say that, in effect, councillors should pay half the salary of community board members, uh, which didn't actually make for good relationships. Um, that's likely to go uh, with a current remuneration authority review, but we need to look at how to strengthen community governance, like, particularly, as I say, in preparation for things like the impact of an ageing population, but also looking at the needs of different communities. Miravale versus Matua, we obviously have different governance needs around issues, as, around areas as different as that. Finally, we need to remain vigilant against what could come through the next mix. The Local Government Efficiency Task Force has basically said that, whoops, we think local government is representative, not participatory, and the purpose that has to do with local government promoting local democratic decision-making and action by and on behalf of the community should be rewritten to make it clear that it's representative democracy and associated with that the suggestion that most local government requirements to consult should go, is in fact flying in the exact opposite direction. And we need to be very clear that consultation, for example, is not an issue that should be looked at in terms of this is inconvenient for council organisations. It should be looked at in terms of how do we get effective dialogue. Everybody knows the present consultation provisions don't work well. But we need to say, Local government is in the business of serving its communities. It's in the business of promoting good governance across everything which happens through a community. It's in the business of looking at how it can pull out the skills and the leadership to address the major issues that we all know that we've got on the plate. And they're not just potholes. They are, as I've said before, issues around community dysfunction, around housing, around social services in different guises, around coping with an ageing population around coping with demographic change, we need processes which allow and enable that dialogue, and some of the signals coming out suggest that that hasn't yet dawned on government. To conclude, my personal view is we're at the beginnings, as I think Bill signalled earlier, of some very significant change. It's hugely exciting. It has the potential to under to unleash enormous energy across communities which has been bottled up by the lack of any way to express it. I'm extremely positive and I look to the change that we need from our local government practices that will allow that to happen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've got five minutes or so that we can devote to questions before we, uh, before we hear from Rod Orham. Um, Peter has said plenty to uh, get your minds thinking. Over to you, questions and comments. <laughs> Over here. Mm -hmm. Peter, you talk about lack of research, uh, but there are talk about unitary councils versus territorial and regional councils separated. Is, is there any research that you can tell us about that shows the benefits or otherwise of the unitary council model? <laughs> um, the answer is yes, but not, I suspect, in quite the direct way, because it's an, it's an answer that goes back to what I posed towards the end of what I was saying, that the really important thing you need to focus on is what's the issue you're trying to resolve? And if you look at the unitary versus 
regional and territorial. Um, it's very hard in the way that the debate's being run to see well, what's, what's the question. And the separate thing is that you need to think about what are the other questions that you should be asking as well. Um, some of the Australian work, for example, is focused very much on strategic capability. The sense that in today's environment, the complexity of the issues facing councils is now pretty substantial. And it's only really quite large councils that will be able to attract and retain the calibre of people who will be able to deal effectively with that complexity. And that's not to do with, you know, we can't afford the salary. It's what's the nature and quality of the work to match the, the skill that we need. Uh, so th it, it, it's a complex one. There's a, whole, there's a whole raft of different things that you would take in different ways. And what you'd really be doing is saying, how does a unitary score versus a regional slash territorial on this dimension, this dimension, this dimension, and what will research tell us about the best way of handling each of these different dimensions? So it's, it's not straightforward. But it's out there if you... That's why we need in-depth research capability, not just someone go out and do us a 20-page report on X, please. Or indeed, the possible option of horizontal organisational forms. Another question down here. Uh, just before we proceed, uh, sorry, I should have uh, mentioned our assistant has a travelling microphone to um, make sure that the question is picked up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Roger Gordon from Rotorua, and uh, thank you for saying we won't have an aggressive takeover. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. But I, I think this, uh, this question that you raise of the more uh, effective uh, community ability to deal with some of our social challenges that we've got, does that also therefore imply that there'll be a different funding model in terms of the overall taxation base of New Zealand and moving more of the, the taxation revenue back to the local community? Not necessarily. I'm, uh, it's, I'm, I'm not just being facetious here. Uh, if you look, for example, at the way that England has been moving in this area, they've adopted a practice that they call community budgets, which is actually sitting the local authority, and the different government agencies, and maybe the third sector around the table and saying, OK, we've each of us got some cash which is earmarked for this particular area of activity. How do we best pool it and focus together to make the best use of that within our community. So that doesn't, that's one approach. Um, because we know at the moment that different sorts of agencies and so on are all sort of spending in a common area and they're not coordinating. So the first step has really been to look at how do we better coordinate and collaborate around that um, rather than the next step to, well, do we do as local government New Zealand would like? Um, create, say, a local income tax or a, you know, a surcharge on GST. So I think the first step is around better collaboration, common pooling of funds, shared decision making about how best to apply them. Again, to make the point in a lot of the public management literature in the same way that people are increasingly talking about organisational network type forms, budgets that go with them, horizontal budgets spent, uh, spent by, uh, by multi-parties. Time for a couple more questions before we go to the next speaker. Please, down the back. <laughs> Here, Paul Thomas. You seem to be giving a different message slightly to Mike Reed, uh, Peter. Could you make a comment when you talked about the new, ro new ro reorganisation proposals preventing local government commission from assessing proposals which involve a hostile takeover. I did read an article about Wonga Ray, this, about Wonga Ray the other day uh, when the uh, handshake was made by Northern, uh, Far North saying that we weren't involved in this. Would that be a hostile takeover, do you think? You're talking about the Far North's application. Um, the application that went to the Local Government Commission included a letter in support from the Mayor of Whanga Ray. So that, I think the Commissioner could reasonably say, well, that suggests there, there is demonstrable community support in Whangarei because if the mayor signs something, yeah, so. I understand that. I'm just reading from that well-known local government magazine that's been, uh, that comes around every month and uh, that was the comments they made in that magazine. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I don't think Mike, Mike, and, Mike and I actually, I think we've discussed this. We, we agree on our interpretation. Um, I think the far north one was simply, it's also that the commission's feeling its way, but 
I mean, my Rotorua reference is simply what, what the, the impression you get at the moment is that nobody in Rotorua is going to stand up and say being part of a larger council controlled from somewhere else is something we want to have happen. And if, so therefore, no likelihood of a proposal being considered that would have that in mind. It would be different if, for example, the Rotorua Chamber of Commerce said, bloody good idea, we couldn't think of a better future than being run from Tarawa. Um, but I don't think that's on the agenda either. Thank you for acknowledging <laughs> Any more, or should we push on? Yeah, we'll push on. Peter, again, thank you.